Hello folks, I hope you're having a great day today. Hey, today we're going to be taking a look at Manly Wade Wellman. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at one of his works that he published in Weird Tales in the 30s called Kelpie. It's a short story uh, and so forth. It's definitely more of the sort of fantasy genre uh, with a hor more, more horror uh, spin to it, although it takes one of those sort of myths. Although this is a common horror trope at the time, uh, but takes sort of a, a myth or a legend and turns it into more of a horror trope and so forth. So you're going to be getting that here uh, with this. Uh, so let's take a look. First of all, mainly Wade Wellman. Uh, let's talk. This is the first time I've done a story by him. So a lot of times, when first time I do an author, I like to unpack a little bit of the author context that the author's writing in and so forth. Mainly Wade Wellman. First of all, I think he's got the coolest name ever. His name is not a pseudonym that he took on. It's not a pen name. His name is Manly Wade Wellman. I mean, that's just such a cool name. <laughs> uh, second of all, his life is like he's like like a character from the pulps. I mean, when you start sort of exploring him and the sort of things that you're looking at, man, this guy's life is like it's from the pulps. Uh, for example, um, he was born in um, uh, in Angola, uh, which was a Portuguese colony at the time. Uh, he was there um, with his family and so forth that were journeying there uh, and so forth. They were working over there. Uh, his dad was a, a doctor helping out some of the local folks and so forth. Um, they would immigrate to America later on. Uh, he was brought in, he was uh, like an adopted son of a local chief and so forth, like he was really welcome there and so forth. Uh, and then he, his family would move to the, um, to the States. He would become an American citizen and so forth uh, shortly thereafter. So he's an American um, and had grown up here uh, in, uh, in the States. He went to a few different places and so forth. Ultimately, he wanted to decide to study arts. He did a lot of other things too. He was very passionate about a lot of projects. Ultimately, he decided to want to write and so forth. In the early 20s to mid 20s, he's getting his degree um, at collegiate levels and so forth at some high quality institutions. And um, he has sent, written a story um, as one of his sort of final projects. Um, his teacher says, that's kind of weird. I don't think that's really gonna, something that's going to sell. It's kind of crazy. Um, so he sends it out to Weird Tales and he sells it immediately to Weird Tales. And he becomes a published writer right then and there um, in his early 20s. Um, and then from then on, nothing's going to stomp him. This guy has a very quick writing clip. And he's a very good writer, too, um, and so forth. So what we're going to be doing today is taking a look at Kelpie. Now, I have just grabbed this collection from him. Uh, uh, up until this past week or so, I've probably only read about four or five short stories by Manly Wade Wellman and so forth. Um, and then I grabbed this big, giant, dense. This is actually a reprinting. My copy is actually a reprinting of an original cover. That this, this was originally um, a collection of his works that was published in 73 by Carcosa Press um, and so forth. So this is a reprinting of that um, from a couple of years ago and so forth. And it basically puts together about 28 or so of his uh, short stories that he published in the fantasy and horror genres. Um, so I've been reading them. I've already read about probably about 40%, probably about seven or eight of them, so probably about 25%, probably about a fourth of them or so, uh, so far. Um, and they're all good. Um, he's a very good writer. We're going to take a look at Kelpie, uh, and then we're also going to take a look at another book, one that he wrote, which I like a little bit more, Frog Father. Um, Frog Father is actually in the book earlier in the collection, um, but it was published about 10 years later. Uh, it was when it was written for Weird Tales 2, um, and so forth. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and make this a part of my sort of Weird Tales Tuesday. Um, if you guys... Uh, I'll follow the channel. You'll know that I do a lot of Weird Tales stuff. Um, I like to do it uh, and so forth. So we'll take a look at the story of the Kelpie real quickly for you and then we'll talk about how why I like it, um, how influential a woman is and so forth and then take a look at um, what you guys think about it too if you've ever had a chance to read it. If not, I'll, I'll link you to it and so forth in the comments below. So let's just go ahead and get started. In Kelpie, um, and Kelpie's like a six-page story in that collection, so it's not going to take you that long to read. <laughs> um, but in this story, basically what's happening um, is you're going to be introduced to two characters. Now, what I want to do is, to give you kind of a feel for Manly Wade Wellman as a writer, I'm actually going to read to you um, like a line or two from the first paragraph. So you can kind of get a feel for what he's like as a writer. Because again, I think that uh, Manly Away Woman is probably somebody who unfortunately isn't well known today. And he should be. Because he's, he's always been an incredibly well writer. He's been hugely influential and so forth. But I think uh, outside of like fans of the genre that really care about like sort of pursuing sort of the things that were around at the same time um, and so forth, he's probably the last well read. But here, let me give you an example of a line from him. This is the final paragraph of a line from the opening paragraph, which is only like four, four sentences long. All right, here you go. They were kissing 
with the hungry fierceness of lovers who dealt their own good fortune. They were kissing with the hungry fierceness of lovers who dealt their own good fortune. That's just a clever line. It's a clever way of phrasing, you know, two people that are greeting each other and starting to make out and so forth with the, 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 the hungry fierceness, you know, and so forth um, and so forth. That's just, I think, a well-written, real, well-concepted line um, and so forth. And he will continue to do that throughout. He's a good, he's a good wordsmith, if that makes sense, um, and so forth. So anyway, in Kelpie, you're going to have the two main characters that you were introduced to in the first paragraph that are kissing and making out and so forth, uh, Lou and Cannon. And Lou is the female character, and Cannon is the guy, and so forth. Um, and she is going to think that she she is going to be feeling she's going to break off uh, the kiss after about the first paragraph, saying that she feels like somebody's watching them, and so forth. Um, they're going to be he's going to be like, no, I sent home the staff and the servants and so forth, so it's just two of us, uh, and so forth. But then he starts to feel it too, so they do a little bit of a look around for the place and so forth. She starts to talk about his aquarium and new projects that came in. He's a botanist, and so he really uh, on the side and so forth. That's sort of his passion. Um, so he he has like these aquariums that he'll keep uh, plants in and so forth, and then he will investigate them scientifically under mic microscopes and such. Um, so he's a but anyway he's a, he's a botanist and such. So anyway, um, as a part of his, he talks about like he just recently got a shipment of of stuff in from um, Lake Lock in I'm, I'm sorry um, Lock Kelp in um, the Highlands in Scotland and so forth. So he's letting it stay out in the aquarium overnight and so forth. Um, and he just recently put them in there and such. Anyway, they get to drinking and start to make out a little bit again. She feels that she's seeing something again though um, and so forth. Uh, so they'll separate while they're searching for some stuff. Uh, and so forth, and then she, while she while he does, um, and he's out of the room for a little bit, she sees something in the aquarium. She goes over to take a look at it, and so forth, and it seems like it's something that's coming out of the aquarium, uh, and so forth. So actually, that's about halfway through the story of six pages. <laughs> so I'll stop you there, and so forth. It's a traditional horror story, um, and so forth. It'll use the myth of the Kelpie uh, from the Highlands, and so forth, to create uh, a sort of character. Um, in a in a horror context and so forth, and and but that's it. I'll go ahead and stop you right there because uh, it's a six page story. I don't want to spoil it for you for too long. But it didn't even take me a half an hour to read it this morning. I probably took me like twenty five minutes to read it just now. Uh, and I was like, this is a good story. I want to go ahead and get it for you and so forth. It's not as good as Frog Father. I think Frog Father is a little better. I'll, I'll uh, and so forth. Um, but yeah. But anyway, so let's take a little, you know, let's put a pin in it and so forth. Again, I showed you a little bit of his writing up front. He's very good as a writer. He's very gifted as a writer. He published a lot of stuff. A lot of his stuff was in Weird Tales, but a lot of his stuff was also going to be published outside of Weird Tales too. Um, he published hundreds of short stories. He created a lot of sort of things. Uh, because his family and himself moved to the mountains of North Carolina and stuff, he was a big writer of a lot of sort of Appalachian folklore, um, Appalachian characters and so forth. So he's going to have a lot of that sort of mountains and Appalachian and particularly the southern Appalachian parts of uh, in, in a feel for most of his works. Um, and they're going to be set in those places. And I think Frogfather is a great example of that. Um, and how he takes myths uh, and so forth that he had heard uh, and so forth. Now he's actually a mixed, uh, mixed ancestry himself. He's part Indian. Uh, and so forth, and so he'll you'll actually get a he'll actually have, and you'll see this in Frogfather. Um, you'll actually you'll actually see all of his characters seem to be sympathetic, um, and sometimes he'll have characters that aren't your traditional sort of you know white heroes. Uh, Lou, her race is never specifically stated, and so forth. Uh, but the way he spells her name, the way he sort of talks about her, um, her physical characteristics, and so forth, it seems like she's an Asian character, uh, and so forth. Um, anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, she doesn't, she's not a t she's just like, hey, I'm going to scream and panic and so forth from the for a man to save me. Although that does in fact happen because of what a Kelpie is. Uh, and so forth. She's being intentionally t targeted by the Kelpie, but that's because of the Kelpie myth and so forth. Not because of who the woman is. And, you know, Manly thinks that, uh, you know, a man named Manly thinks that, you know, all the women out there are just, you know, are going to be womanly <laughs> uh, and so forth. And, uh, you know, he doesn't, ha he doesn't, so far. Um, in my writing, about 10 stories in, doesn't seem, I think, to have uh, as, as strong a trope, although, again, he, his women are still going to fall into the two sort of archetypes of women in the uh, uh, in this era uh, of the virginal sort of innocent woman or the sexually open woman who's dangerous uh, and so forth. And so, uh, um, so far, all the women that I've read so far have felt fallen into those tropes. But Frogfather's going to have, which I will review for you right as soon as we finish this up, um, has an example of a Native American in it who's very warmly uh, characterized and so forth um, and such. So we'll take a look at that. And, and I like Frogfather a lot. 
um, and so forth. And, uh, and this story also resonated with me too. Um, I like the idea of the aquarium. I like the idea of bringing in a Kelpie uh, and, and so forth from the mythologies and so forth. And it's a good six pages. It was worth my time um, and so forth. So again, I wanted to bring it to you today as well as Manly Wade Wellman. Now, he is somebody who's been very influential uh, for folks that were reading Pulp Air stuff. Um, particularly, for, so for example, uh, Gary Gygax cites uh, Manly Wade Wellman as an influence in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, in his famous Appendix N, which is at the end of the first uh, Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master's Manual um, that he published in the 70s when he said, here's where I got all of my sort of inspirations for the game and, the, and things from, um, and this is where I'd recommend you go if you're looking for inspiration for your own campaigns um, or rules or something like that, right? And so that's where he says, go to, go to these things and so forth, and he lists Manly Wade Wellman specifically. And Manly Wade Wellman's done, like, like I said, so many different things. And so forth. Based on his writing styles, yeah, I can get definitely get it. I see where he was. I see where Gary Gygax was coming from, and so forth. So if you come to Manly Lee Wellman's name, not from you know a pulp era weird tales, you know Cthulhu mythos, because he actually wrote some stories in the Cthulhu mythos or something like that, which is how I came to him. Um, but instead, through like Dungeons and Dragons, epic fantasy, and so forth, through Appendix N, you may have also heard about him too. But again, um, if you're if you're watching this, I cannot recommend him more so far. I think he's very well done, and, I, and again, I think he's somebody who I think we have just absolutely missed on, and so forth. So mea culpa on that, um, and so forth. Uh, I'm probably going to do a deep dive into these short stories. I've already been doing about three or four a day already. Um, I'll probably finish up this this book probably in the next week or so because I really like it a lot. But there you go. That's Manly Way Wellman's uh, The Kelpie. Uh, and so forth. If you've read, let me know what you think about it. I'll give you a link to it later on um, so you can check it out in the comments below. If you're interested in, in reading a collection on it, I'll, I'll look to see if it's in... I don't, I don't know. A lot of the writers who lived later in their lives, and this guy this guy lived until like he was like, I think in his 80s uh, and so forth. Their stuff is not in um, open IP. It's still, it's still owned by somebody uh, and so forth. So if it's not owned by somebody, I'll link you to a collection, but I'll do a little bit of research uh, after I record this, but before I link you to it. Because uh, if it's available free online, I'll, I'll just link you to that but otherwise i'll link you to a collection like this uh, i bought this collection just just last week and it's like 20 bucks on amazon so for 28 stories um that I'm, i've enjoyed every single one of them so far it's, it's pretty good a couple of them are in a cthulhu mythos too so if you came to it from that um you would also have those like the terrible parchment for example uh is a mythos story and it's also in this collection too um, and so forth. But again, there you are. That's mainly Wade Wellman for you. I'll go ahead and leave that. Hey, if you like this video, please feel free to hit that subscribe button. There's going to be so many more of these kind of stories to follow. I'm very passionate about bringing to you classics from fantasy, science fiction, and horror that have been forgotten um, and lost to time, like mainly Wade Wellman um, and so forth. So if you like this, <laughs> there's going to be a whole lot more to follow. And hey, I want to thank you so much if you took some time to watch uh, this whole video to the end. We all have such busy days and busy lives. So the fact that you spent this with me is very humbling and I appreciate that. So thanks again. Have a good one.